the the start date for it kept getting pushed back. They originally wanted the Germans originally wanted to start this this giant battle in mm. May, but they could have for a number of reasons. Um, one of the main reasons was that they were waiting for their sort of next generation of tanks to come along. Right, the Panthers and the Tigers, the big cats. <laughs> I don't know anything about German tanks. So All right, are, they, are okay. these good? Yeah, well, yeah, I, I very assume good. it will be. You know? Yeah, yeah, no, very, very good. Um, well, let's talk about tanks right now. Then, yeah, let's just get into it. Let's talk about All tanks. Right. So I don't know so, anything about tanks. So uh, the Panzers, okay, so like yeah. the Mark V Panzer is they called the Panther, and um, that is a, a very, very good sort of medium to heavy medium battle tank. People are going to, some people love their tanks so much. Yeah, they do. That if uh, you get anything even remotely wrong, they, they, yeah, they, they jump on it. <laughs> they <laughs> so will. I've got to be careful. I, I've had friends who have been massive tank fans, and I'm like, oh, that's, that's interesting. And they argue for literally hours about the, the tiniest specification changes and things. Mm. And I'm just like, mm -hmm. I don't know anything about it, and I don't care. <laughs> the thing about tanks, I would say, across all time, even up to and including nowadays, is um, I was talking to a friend about uh, battleships and there's sort of a sweet spot with battleships. Hmm. You can have a battleship that's just too big and expensive. Yeah. It's just too big and expensive. It's too dangerous. It's too much of a risk to put it out there because it's so big and expensive. Um, but then if you've got um, like a destroyer or a cruiser, sometimes it's not quite powerful enough. Hmm. So anyway, in the terms of battleships, sort of pocket battleships, there's a re there's a real sweet spot to find hmm. where it does, you don't want to be too big and heavy and yeah. cumbersome, it's slow, uh, but it can't be too weak and feeble. Yeah, so now, some, some sort of sort of like you know mid to heavy range where it can put some big guns on it, it can still move fairly fast, but it doesn't cost the earth to field. Right. That's the point. Right. Now the same thing goes for tanks, really, right. and I'm talking very very broadly here. You can have tanks that are too big and heavy. Hmm. It's just as simple as that. Right at the end of the war, the, the Germans made one called the, the Mouse. Um, and it was <laughs> stupidly big and heavy. Right. Uh, they only actually, I think they only made this right at the end of World War II. I think they only like manufactured like three of them or something. Right. Something like that. And did they use them? Uh, I think like one got used one time. Right. And it's just like a moving pillbox. Right. It really is that. And its armour is ridiculously heavy yeah. and good. And its main armament was ridiculously big. But, you know, it still had tracks that could be blown up with a mine or something. And it just cost a lot. And it was so heavy. Um, but it was uh, insanely slow, right? It was insanely slow. Yeah, yeah, yeah insanely slow. Um, and um, it was so heavy that it couldn't really go across, um, like, fields or anything. It would just, right. it would just sink it would sort it. of sink. Yeah. It would even tear, even the big tiger tanks, they would tear up pavement or cobblestone like it was a field. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I and mean, even the biggest tigers by the end of the war were kind of too heavy, right? Really, mm. but then you don't want your tank to be too light, where its armor can just be punched yeah. by. What's uh, the point in having any armor at all? Right. Yeah. So again, you want mm. you want to try and find that sweet spot, and I think tank designs to this day are still trying to find perfectly that mm. that sweet spot. Anyway, the Panther, the Panzer Mark V. In my opinion, I might get some comments saying Bo doesn't know what the hell he's talking about oh, here. This is his his, really his opinion is yeah. just utterly wrong. Yeah. But the Panther, the Mark V, is something like finding that sweet spot, right. I think. Um, because uh, it was, well, it had, what did it have? It had a 75 millimeter gun mm -hmm. on it, which is very good. Right. You know, not quite as good as the old 88, which is really good. But 75 millimeter main gun, a couple of um, machine guns on it. The old MG34s, even better than the MG32s, arguably. Mm -hmm. A couple of really, really, really good machine guns. Uh, Hitler's buzzsaw. Right. Very, very high rate of fire. It had sloped armour, pretty decent sloped armour. Uh, it, it wasn't too slow. I think it could do sort of 35 mile an hour or something. It was a very good sort of medium general purpose tank. Mm. And they wanted, and Hitler wanted as many Panthers as possible at Kursk. And so he had to put it back. In the end, right. they didn't start until the very beginning of July at Kursk. Right. And one of the reasons was so they could get more Panthers in the field. Hmm. But then also the Mark VI, the Tiger I, the first Tiger tanks. Now, that really is a heavy battle tank now, Tiger. Tiger weighs 55 tons. That's, That's heavy. 
It's really heavy. Again, <laughs> yeah, it's 55 you, tons. Again, you've got to worry about whether bridges are going to collapse. Yeah. Smaller bridges are going to collapse under that. Yeah, yeah. And whether it's going to sink in, in mud, like sink and never come yeah. out yeah, of yeah. muddy places. Yeah. And yeah, it'll just tear up pavements and stuff. I like, can believe it. Yeah. 55 tons of tank going across the pavement. I can believe it. Yeah. Local council's furious. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not meant for city centres, really. Yeah, the Mark yeah. One Tiger yeah. um, had 110 millimeters of armour. That's very, very thick. Yeah. That means that that's like 11 centimeters of armour, isn't it? Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like nearly yeah. a foot. Yeah. 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 It's a hell of a lot of armour. So that means that and only that's a steel really... plate, isn't it? Yeah, steel. Yeah. So that like <laughs> that. You no know, wonder it's 55 bloody tons. You've got foot thick steel armor all over it. That means that anything other than point blank range, a, a T thirty four can't punch through that. And even a point blank range sometimes not. You yeah, need yeah. a you need a heavy howitzer yeah. to punch through that. Yeah. So it's almost impervious. In nineteen forty three, yeah. it was sort of impervious to most things the German the Russians had. Yeah. Uh, the thing is though about the tiger, and I'll put up a picture. It didn't have sloped armor. Right. It was flat sided. Yeah, because I'm not I'm no physics uh, student. But as I understand it, uh, you want to deflect the energy rather right. than stop the energy. And yeah. so if you have a slope, you it goes ping and the energy carries on, diverting. You know, you haven't uh, whack. So now you have to take responsibility for all of that energy impacting. So why didn't they give it sloped armor? I don't know. It's just a flaw in the design, really. Because right. um, if it had sloped armor, it probably would have been impenetrable, right? Yeah, slope having sloped versus flat sided armor is a massive difference. A and massive, it's, massive it's difference. also just a no brainer for someone with GCSE physics like I've got. Yeah, I mean, just, it's just the way that force works. Because that idea that an enemy shell will skip off you, bounce yeah. off you, basically that's not sometimes. That's a lot of the time. Yeah, a lot of the time. And it's it's with so, it's not even with it's with any kind of armor. This is why medieval um, you know breastplates. Uh, Fluted, yeah, yeah, in, in, you know, yeah. the, the so arrows will skim off. Yeah, exactly. So they'll bounce off rather than penetrating into it. It's like it's just a well-known dictum of arms and armor. The physics of ballistic is ballistics is really really interesting. Yeah. I've watched lots of sort of videos about it. There's yeah. one clip I saw not that long ago, just a couple of months ago. Some guy I can't remember where uh, looked like somewhere in the Middle East. He was shooting just out of a, a, a submachine gun, an AK mm. or something. I don't know what it was, an AR or something. He was shooting tracer rounds at night mm. onto um, a, a a lake, a, a reservoir. Right. And they're bouncing off. Yeah. Bullets are bouncing off water. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's just the way ballistics works. Yep. Uh, the right angle. It has yep. to be the right angle. Yeah. yeah. But bullets and shells will bounce off things yep. if it's if it's right you don't want flat sided armor on your tank is basically yeah. the bottom line well, yeah. <laughs> full stop you know it's, yeah. it's 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 easier to deflect than it is to stop yeah. and it's more preferable in almost every circumstance and the tiger one had an 88 mm main gun on its turret which i assume is huge i don't know the yeah. other guns either 88 mm guns it's like a, it's an it's a full artillery piece really <laughs> Right. Uh, yeah, um, even in in the West, in the Americans yeah. and the British experience, whenever there are 88s on the field, yeah. it's like, we've got to take those out first. That's the yeah, number one thing. In Band of Brothers, they're like, we've got to silence the 88s immediately. Yeah. So if you've got a tank with an 88 millimeter gun on it, that's pretty that's fearsome armament. Yeah. You could take out a T-34 at two kilometers away. Jeez. It would pop a T-34 at 2,000 meters. Right, okay. So, yeah. right. There's a, there you go. Good news, um, yeah. And they didn't have a fantastic amount of tigers, but, you know, they had a few, a couple of, they had more than a hundred tigers, a couple of hundred tigers mm. um, at Kursk. Um, but the next thing they had was a thing called the, the Ferdinand, and that's really a tank destroyer, getting people to know their stuff. If you confuse a tank with a tank destroyer. Which I would do. Right, yeah. So what's the difference? <laughs> well, uh, there's all sorts of technical differences, but the main point is that it was, it was designed First and foremost, because a tank is sort of a multi-purpose tool, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do it for all sorts of things. Whereas if you've got um, a, a, a vehicle where its main job is to take out enemy armour, that's what it was designed for from, from so scratch, I, from day one. I don't know anything about tank destroyers, but what I'm guessing is they're fairly light vehicles with a big gun on. Not light, though. Well, no? they can be. Yeah, they can be. In the modern era, you can have... As, as in they're, not, but, they're, not, they're not designed to be resilient. Mm. Uh, they're designed to destroy the tank as quickly as possible because they've got a big gun on them. Right. So the Germans had uh, a, a, a vehicle they called the Ferdinand, hmm. named after Ferdinand Porsche. Right. The Porsche company made armour for the Nazis. 
Lots of people did a lot of things for the Nazis. Right. What yeah, are you talking yeah. about? <laughs> yeah. We can't use Twitter, but we can. Uh, no, sorry. I think it's funny. Jerry Seinfeld's got a giant Porsche collection. I wonder what he feels about that. Anyway. Well, the, Adidas, the, Adidas can't have Kanye West on uh, stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, anyways. Um, they built this Ferdinand. They only had, I think, about 90 of them. Um, and they were they were super heavy, way over, way, really? way, way, way over heavy. They weighed like 68 tonnes. They had 200 cool. millimetres of armour on them. They could only go 12 mile an hour. They had no machine guns on them. They just had a giant, they, it was an 88 millimetre gun, but a special long barrelled one. Right. Um, and yeah, in like the first day or two, almost half of them were lost. Yeah, this sounds overly specialised. Right. I mean, when they're not like something they could give lightly armored or infantry to destroy tanks. Oh, yeah, there are that sort of thing. Yeah. You can have it. There's such a, there's like an anti-tank rifle. Right. You can believe it. Just like a massive, massive rifle, really, with like a huge round, much bigger than sort of a 50 cal round. Yeah. And uh, as long as you're not shooting a tiger directly in the face, it should be able to go through tank yeah. armor, you know, like go, it should penetrate a panther. Or to penetrate a T-34. So there are uh, arms like that. Yeah. So I would have invested in that rather than 70 ton, 12 mile an hour moving tank destroyers. But I'm not, you know, I'm not in charge. I'm just, just armchair generally. I and mean, it didn't have machine guns sort of in, as part of the vehicle. So it relied on infantry with it. Yeah. So if it ever got separated from infantry, which yeah. of course it did, then... Soviet troops could literally walk up to it well, and, yeah. and place a mine on it or yeah. under it. Pretty much literally, literally do that. Because you can't do anything about them. Right. So they lost like half their Ferdinands in like a day or two. Yeah. And the Germans would pump loads and loads of money and energy and time yeah. into that. Resources. You know, right. Just, you yeah. know, steel. Like the actual you know, fuel. So here's the thing. The Russians can replace their T-34s, no problem. Every single Tiger and Ferdinand and Panther that's lost, mm. it's lost forever. Mm. That's it. It was it was priceless yeah. in in a sense. Um, yeah. And how, and the Russians, as I understand, the Russians literally physically moved their factories east. Yeah, right. They did away from Moscow, like Incredibly. dismantled. Yeah, dismantled the factories, moved them like you know five hundred miles east, and then just set them up again and start producing more tanks. Yeah. So that that sort of thing slowed down their production, but. It's a million Slo times better than letting it fall into the German hands. Oh, yeah. So. Slows down your production for a period of time. And then when it's back up and running, okay, well, then you're back up and running. That's an amazing feat, that. Yeah, it that's is. That's something that's often, quite often, a yeah. footnote yeah. in World War II on the history of the Eastern Front. Is, oh, oh, Stalin ju just moved loads of his factories brick, brick by brick, hundreds of miles eastwards. Oh, did he? Yeah. Wow. That must what? have been a that's massive incredible. endeavor. Uh, yeah. You know, tens of thousands of people doing that. And the political will, yeah. or uh, the technical ability, all mm. sorts of things to do that. It's it's sort of incredible. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yet that's what was done. Yeah. And so the Germans sort of couldn't, just could not stop the Soviets from pumping out endless numbers of T-34s. Yeah. Let's talk about the, the Soviet tanks. So the T-34, yeah, and they had the KV, they had a KV-1, which was their version of a heavier tank. Right. That's their version of a heavy tank. Um, well, just to talk about the T-34. It was um, it was a very good multi-purpose tank. I mean, it was crude. Apparently it was. It, well, it is a crude version of a tank. As I understand it, the Russian um, tanks were anything but comfortable as well. Oh, yeah. Very cramped. It's quite a small tank, really, right. T-34. Relatively small. But it had, it had the things it needed. So it had really relatively wide caterpillar tracks. Right. Exactly what you need for snow and mud. Yeah. It was not too heavy. Um, it's only 26 tons, your average T-34, mm -hmm. depending on what variant it is and things. So that's not too heavy. Yeah. And with wide tracks, it just means it can go places the German tanks won't be able to. Yep. Um, it had a reliable engine. Well, that's See, important. the Panthers, for example, and the Tigers, they had really dodgy carburetors, for example. The carburetor would set on fire in a Panther all the time. Can't Things like that. News, yeah. It sounds like a little detail. No, that doesn't sound like a little detail right, at all. You're, like, you're inside this very cramped metal box and suddenly the engine's on fire. It doesn't sound like a small detail to me. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sounds like a really important detail. Well, some have said that they lost more Panthers or were unable to put more Panthers in into the field at Kursk than were lost on the battlefield because mm. their engines had broken, specifically the carburetors, and quite often, mm. quite often get said. Um 
Whereas the T34 had sort of a basic, it was basic, yeah. but reliable Which engine. Which seems it. deeply important when you're like, you know, 500 miles from the nearest, like, you know, engineering station or something. And yeah, yeah, you're just off on your own or you're part of a squadron miles away from anywhere. If there's one thing you want, it is surely reliability. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to get tramped in the middle of the tundra. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so like the Panther had sort of, they said like an overly complicated, a few of the mechanisms on it were sort oh, of overly complicated. Who could have believed that? If it all worked perfectly, it it would have been amazing. It would have been brilliant. Just, but quite often they weren't. Who could have imagined um, the Germans would have designed something overly complicated because they were just more smart than you? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, this is my German bigotry. <laughs> but I am right about it. So, <laughs> so like, just one example. The Panther had this mechanism that would clear, um, it, was, it was meant to sort of, clear the gases and smoke out of the gun barrel quicker right and so if it would if everything had worked perfectly that's great that could, it could be a game rate changer of fire, yeah. exactly it could be could have been brilliant but where they were rushed a little bit rushed into production a little bit rushed to the front it often didn't work just in reality at kursk when it needed to and so just yeah. confirms everything i say about german philosophy stalin's famous as saying that there's a quantity as a quality all of its own yeah. well at Kursk that was proved true yes that was proved true uh, but the, the T-34 had a really really almost embarrassingly simple turret right, where you okay. had to traverse it by hand <laughs> the guy inside was like literally cranking it round and the Germans didn't have that Germans of had, course they didn't right <laughs> but <laughs> looking back at it now in the 21st century yeah. it's like wow it's like that's like the things they would have in the first tanks, things yeah, like that. Yeah. World War One tanks. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a World War One thing. Yeah. Uh, but it did have sloping armor, forty-five millimeter sloping armor, right. the T thirty yeah. T thirty-four. So that's that's not bad. Yeah, you know, it's not one hundred and ten like the sure. tank, it's but not a tiger, it's not yeah. it's not bad, and it is sloping. Yeah. So it's almost on a parity with the Panther. Hmm. So it's not bad. Right. That's what I w That's how I would char characterize the T thirty-four. For World War Two, and they didn't really change the design all that much throughout all of World War Two. Yeah, it's not bad. Right, okay. it did the job, and that's yeah. the main thing, right? Yeah, yeah, that's all that really matters. Yeah, can it get the the job done? Yeah, well, if you got enough of them, which it, they it, do, it, it, they, which they do, and it did. And, and how many of these were they producing every year? Oh well, year on year it changed, but loads. By the end, yeah. they could pump out they could pump out hundreds really a month. Yeah. Right, so, okay, yeah. right. Yeah. So the literally, end. like, you know, probably like a thousand a year. By the end. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, loads. That's, that's pretty impressive. Um, yeah. Because they were sort of cookie cutter design. Yeah. Quite yeah, simple, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. Yep. Whereas like the Tigers, they're like these bespoke works of art. Almost. I bet they were. <laughs> yeah. I bet they were. Like the King Tigers, the Royal Tigers by the end. I bet they were they're... incredible feats of engineering. Yeah. Well, they were... took months to put together where some... Very intelligent German expert had crafted the perfect weapon of war. One of them. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. They even say, like, the 88 millimeter gun, it's sort of a triumph of German I artillery design is. and I manufacture. Bet I bet it is. Yeah. I bet it is. Like, honestly, <laughs> I'm sorry to go on about it, but this is, this is the German philosophy applied to everything, though. Like, it's, it's like, look, no, no, we are really intelligent. We're really well disciplined. We're really, we've got an amazing eye for detail. And we're going to produce something that is immaculate and incredible. And like in, in like World War One, where like German goods had to be stamped with "Made in Germany" on them, because it's like, oh, well, people will be prejudiced and they won't buy German goods. It's like, yeah, but that actually just becomes a mark of quality. You know, it's like, oh, it's made in Germany. Well, I know that's going to be good then. It's like, yes, it is going to be good because this is the German approach to things. But it's also a very theoretical approach, and it turns out that actually, like, you don't need to have. And the, the the Russian tank example is just the perfect example, actually. It's like the Germans, I don't doubt, would have sneered at the Russian tank designs for being primitive. It's like, okay, but there are also other virtues to this, which, as you say, is the simplicity of it. You know, as in, we can produce a lot of these, you know, and it, it, this is this is the German attitude. It's like, look, the, it, not everything has to be perfect. Functional is good enough if there are other virtues, such as ease of manufacture or whatever. Isn't it just known literally around the world that a Mercedes Benz is a great? It's a great car. It's well engineered. Sure, you can rely yeah. on a Merc. Sure, right. <laughs> I mean, from F one to uh, uh, African dictators. Yep, 
you want a Mercedes big. But they're also um, expensive. Uh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because <laughs> you've got to pay for what you get. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, even, um, well, anyway, go on about German yeah, yeah. engineering. Could go but, on and on and on. But it really does speak to the German philosophy and outlook on life. And, it, it, mm. and it, you know, yeah, it's, good true, to have, it's good to have really high standards, but it's also kind of monomaniacal in a way. Right, and I'm I'm constantly going on about oh we should have high standards and things like that, and that is true. But there's a time and a place, and sometimes you just need what works, and this is where the Russians are proving. Look, this is just going to work. Mm. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. And they would train their men to know how best to take out a, a German tank. Obviously, they would literally train them. Look, go for the tracks, mm. go for the underside. If you can, you know, get yeah. a mine under them any way you can. Yeah. All sorts of things. So, didn't they train dogs to go under them? And stuff like yeah, that? yeah, yeah. I'm not sure how much that actually happened, I doubt that but worked, it but did. Yeah. It, they definitely did do that. Yeah. Um, so you strap a mine to a dog and train it to run under a tank, and then you'd blow it up remotely. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm not sure how much that actually, ha- whether that happened loads, but it definitely happened a bit. Right. And after the Germans cottoned onto that, they just started shooting any dog they saw, just in case it was a trained or dog tank destroyer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.